Um, from a baby point of view, um, the so-called fetal or neonatal crisis, preterm delivery. Preeclampsia is the biggest single cause of iatrogenic prematurity, so prematurity that we deliberately cause. Um, fetal growth restriction, I'll come back to hypoxia, perinatal death, and there are some concerns about lo long-term effects on cardiovascular morbidity, this Barker hypothesis, fetal origin of adult disease. Now, the magnitude of this risk depends on gestational age at diagnosis, gestational age at delivery, the severity of the disease process, and the presence or absence of other associated medical disorders, things like renal disease, for example. Um, now, the first two are probably blindingly obvious if you're a fetus, but it also affects, it also applies to the mother as well. The main reasons that we end up delivering women with preeclampsia is because of maternal problems. They get symptoms, abruption would be a good example. Because their hypertension becomes increasingly difficult to control, because they get a complication like Kelp syndrome, or from a fetal point of view, you have abnormalities in the CTG, abnormalities in fetal Doppler. Or because they get to an age where we don't think it's worth prolonging the pregnancy. In Oxford, we tend to bear, someone's got proteinuric preeclampsia, we tend to aim for delivery at somewhere between 36 and 37 weeks, depending on disease severity. Um, a lot of them are delivered by cesarean section, although no, not necessarily all. If we feel that the fetus has a good chance of, of being okay in labour, then we will try and induce them. Um, as you probably know, a lot of women with preeclampsia often labour very well. Incidence of preeclampsia, it's surprisingly difficult to get accurate figures. It's estimated that mild preeclampsia affects 10% of women in their first pregnancy. Severe preeclampsia probably affects about 1%. Um, it is very difficult to get accurate figures. There are huge controversies in definition about preeclampsia. Some preeclampsia presents in an atypical fashion. And even if you do agree on the diagnostic criteria, um, they are sometimes unreliable in those with pre-existing disease, like renal disease, for example. You know, if you're someone who pours out three grams of protein even when you're not pregnant, that makes the diagnosis of preeclampsia more difficult to define. With regard to delivery, do you need to deliver the minute you get preeclampsia? Well, we think the answer is no. Um, as a ballpark figure, um, once you have significant proteinuria, in Oxford we use a cutoff of 500 milligrams in 24 hours. Um, once you have significant proteinuria, the time between having that and needing delivery because of one of the crises I've mentioned is about 14 days, about two weeks. Um, if anything, the smaller growth restricted babies uh, earlier in gestation tend to go on a little bit longer than the ones to whom it happens in well grown babies near to term. They seem to be able to tolerate the conditions of preeclampsia less well. Um, a survey was done in Oxford of 122 cases um, presenting with proteinuric preeclampsia at less than 32 weeks. The average gestational age at the onset of preeclampsia was about 28 and a half weeks. And on average, they delivered 15.2 um, days later. But the problem is the range. Okay. You can't say to someone with proteinuric preeclampsia, go home, we'll see you in a couple of weeks and sort out your delivery then. Okay. The problem is the lead time. It's the same with virtually all the diagnostic tests that we use, antenatal CTGs, double like artery Doppler, fetal Doppler, um, biophysical profiles. They're good, they're not bad, and they're very useful tests, but they're not totally reliable, both for acute events um, and you know, just sometimes people do, mothers and babies do unpredictable things in the context of preeclampsia. Certainly in Oxford, we manage all our proteinuric preeclampsics as inpatients. With regard to treatment, you need to treat maternal hypertension 
for the sake of the mother, and the confidential inquiry brings this out, you need to pay attention to both the systolic and the diastolic um, blood pressure, and the emphasis is now on sort of mean arterial pressures. Okay? Treatment doesn't affect the underlying disease process, although it may prolong gestation because it may avoid this iatrogenic prematurity. You may feel that you don't need to deliver because the blood pressure comes under control, and in that way it may improve outcome. We tend to start with methyl dopa, alpha-2 partial agonists, um, unless people have got a history of depression, in which case we try and avoid it because that is one of the side effects of methyl dopa. We go up to a maximum of about 500 milligrams four times a day. And then we start adding in usually nifedipine next, nabetalon, which is a beta blocker. And once in a while we have ladies on all that and doxazacin as well. So we sometimes end up with people on cocktails of four different antihypertensives. Postnatally, we stop the methyl dopa in everyone because of this postnatal depression. We move people on to oxprenolol. It's just our choice of a beta blocker. It's a short-acting one, and for the time when people's blood pressure is really quite labile in the postnatal period, it's easy to change doses and have an effect. With regard to treating acute severe hypertension, we have an action line of, of greater than 170 over 110, and if someone hits that blood pressure, they get it rechecked 15 minutes later and we then treat them with nifedipine, 10 milligrams of, of oral nifedipine. We recheck that in an hour. If it doesn't come down, we give them another nifedipine. If that doesn't work, we tend to give them a one shot of 10 milligrams of IM hydralazine, and then move on to a, a libetalon infusion. Depending a little bit on the situation, we may go straight to a libetalon infusion. We have some reservations about trying to treat very high blood pressures with oral medication if someone, for example, is in labor because, as you know, they don't, they don't absorb very much. Moving on to eclampsia. Um, a lot of what we know about eclampsia in the United Kingdom um, comes from the results of a nationwide study conducted back in 1992. Um, Douglas and Redmond consulted all the consultant-led obstetric units in the UK and found they had 383 confirmed cases of eclampsia. From that they worked out the incidence is about 1 in 2,000. So that means most units in the UK are probably seeing 1 or 2 eclamptics a year. I'll come back to that. Maternal mortality is about 1 in 50. They, they can occur antipartum, intrapartum, and a lot of them, a significant number of them occur postpartum. Mm -hmm. Having your obstetric god, obstetric goddess moment, think, well done me, I've delivered the baby, everybody you know, relaxes a little bit, and then you know, someone goes and has an eclamptic fit. Symptoms before eclampsia. No symptoms in 41%. 50% had a headache. Nearly 20% had visual disturbances and epigastric pain. Most convulsions can occur despite antenatal care. Three quarters of first eclamptic fits occurred in hospital. If you looked at the blood pressure at any time during the hospital stay, the average maximum was 181 over 115. But if you looked at the last blood pressure taken before someone fitted, um, in 20% it was less than 95 millimeters of mercury. Um, Eclamptic fits are not a sort of, the blood pressure goes up and up and up and up until somebody finally blows a gasket and starts fitting. 